Good morning, and welcome to Off Lake Church. So glad you could join us this morning. The title for our message today is Joyful Affection in Christ Jesus, and we'll be using for our text Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. If you want to follow along, that would be terrific. So let's pray just before we begin. So Father, we once again thank you for this day, for your goodness to us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand um, this text this morning and lead us and guide us by your Spirit and even comfort us as we, as we read and study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. As a pastor, one of the things that concerns me about the local church, something I do my best to look out for and guard against, is the subtle creeping in of complacency, resulting in a lack of camaraderie, friendship, and togetherness. You see, it's easy to fall into a routine of simply coming and going every Sunday morning, sometimes for years, without actually associating with anyone in a meaningful way. Now understand, I'm not picking on anyone this morning. In fact, I've heard tell that this church, Off Lake Church, is an especially friendly group of believers. And I love that about this church. Nevertheless, from time to time, we all need a pleasant reminder. And today just happens to be that time. So as we make our way through our text this morning, specifically as we focus on verses 7 and 8, what I'd like us all to do, even those of you at home, to think of practical ways, means, strategies, and the many possibilities we have to bless one another where we continue to nurture this environment of inclusion, where with hospitality, generosity, kindness, sharing, and genuine love, we not only serve one another in the name of Jesus, but we glorify Jesus' name as we serve. While preaching in Winnipeg some time ago, as I was ready to wrap up the message, I felt strangely compelled to challenge the 300 people in attendance with this thought of one another. I kindly asked them to stand up, which they all did, and it was then that I made some of them very uncomfortable. You see, as they stood in their place, what I did was encourage them to look around, to look at the faces in the room, to take special notice of everyone in attendance and understand that these fellow believers are in fact 
our brothers and sisters in Christ. And not only are they our spiritual family, they are Jesus' inheritance as well. Because of that, there is no excuse for complacency on our part in reaching out to one another. Neither is there any room for the intentional exclusion of any of God's children from the fellowship of the saints. John writes this in his first letter, 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, all of us, that we, all of us, should be called children of God, and so we, all of us, are. The reason why the world does not know us, all of us, is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we, all of us, shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Well, at the end of this service, Someone came up to me and said that in all her years of attending that church, she had never experienced anything like that before. It was profound, she said, to take special notice of the many faces. Some were familiar friends. Others were neighbors. But many folks she didn't know and couldn't name. Well, my concern back then, my concern today as well, is that some people come to church week after week, year after year, even decade after decade, especially in a large church, lonely, discouraged, and friendless. The truth is this. There is no way to know how a person is getting along in life unless someone takes the time to get to know that person. And while everyone does their best, I believe, to take that next step in life without a friend to come alongside in a time of need, many will face that next step alone. You see, there's a genuine profoundness in partnership. Something Paul not only understood, but taught. Where the body of Christ, the community of believers, come together to hear the word of God preached, to participate in worship, to sharpen and encourage one another, to teach our children to love Jesus, to learn what it is to be light in our communities, to bear one another's burdens, to use our God-given gifts for the good of the church, and to find someone who will walk alongside as a mentor. But sadly, that's not always the case in the church. And if we're not mindful, if we're not watchful, and if we're not attentive, someone just might be left behind. Hebrews 10, verse 19 through 25, Therefore, brothers, since we, all of us again, have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, all of us, through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, all the more as you see the day drawing near. We, us, our, together, and one another. The writer of Hebrews is making a point here. He's using pluralistic language, referring to the corporate gathering of the church and how important it is that we meet. In other words, because of Jesus, we, the church, belong together and need one another. That's the inference being made here. We all know that people are social creatures or social beings created by God for relationship with God and with one another. And no matter how strong, how independent, how resourceful, or how self-sufficient we might think ourselves to be, we all need godly friends. Of that I am certain. Because none of us are immune to the pain of loneliness. None of us are immune to despair. And even Paul, the great apostle, wasn't an exception to this reality. In fact, as he suffers his second imprisonment in Rome, when by now he is an old, frail man awaiting death, we can almost feel his anguish as he writes. 2 Timothy 4.9 Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, Paul continues, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, without the support of his closest friends, even the great apostle despaired. Demas, whose name appears as a co-worker in two of Paul's letters, the letters to the Colossians and the letter to Philemon, well, Demas had abandoned him for the world, if you can imagine in other words, Demas chose the corrupt value system of an unsaved world over heavenly values, values he would have learned from the Apostle Paul. I have no doubt that this had to be devastating for Paul. Demas was one of his closest friends. Demas was part of his honorage. Demas was a protege of his. Yet love for this world and for the things of this world had carried Demas away and he left Paul at the time of his greatest need. Now what Demas did wasn't really unique. In fact, in many ways, it was remarkably similar to what the Israelites did 
after God miraculously brought them out of Egypt. For with the promise of a new land, a land of blessing, a land of their own, and a land filled with milk and honey, in other words, prosperity, many former slaves looked back longing for the security of their former lives of slavery. And instead of pressing on for the prize of their inheritance, they all fell, literally fell. They all died short of the promise. Paul writes this to remind his friends to continue on in the faith, to not look back, to not stop. Philippians 3.13. But one thing I do, Paul writes, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, leaning forward, leaning into what lies ahead? I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. So those of us who have been in the faith for a while, those of us who ought to mentor the younger believers, should never look back, but should look forward, should lead the way should show what it is to live a disciplined, seasoned life of following Jesus. Paul continues, verse 17, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So take a look around. Watch out for one another. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Demas, abandon me, left the ministry, chased after the world. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship, well, it's in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Well, as Paul writes, his cell is cold, dark, he's got a chill, and other than Luke, he's alone. As he writes, he asks Timothy to come for one last visit and bring a jacket. You can almost feel Paul's discouragement here. You see, he understands the value of a deep, meaningful genuine friendship. And the members of the Philippian church, well, they were some of his dearest friends. So here's our text. Philippians 1 verse 7. It is right, Paul says, for me to feel this way about you all. It is right, or it is proper for me to feel this way about you. Now, we have to be careful here because the word feel can be easily misunderstood, especially in our day. I mean, Paul isn't describing a simple emotion here, as if this was some superficial response to an acceptable situation. Not at all. In this context, to feel this way is so much deeper than that. What Paul means here is his mindset, his attitude, and his disposition toward these fellow believers was based on his deep affection for them due to their partnership with him. 
in the preaching of the gospel, in his imprisonment, in the defense of the gospel, where unlike Demas, who had abandoned him, these amazing people supported him to the very end. They refused to forget their friend. Remember, as a prisoner, Paul was in chains for his faith. Yet he makes the conscious decision to feel, to think about, or to set his mind on those whom he dearly loves. And what I especially appreciate about verse 7 are the words you all. It is right for me to feel. It is right for me to set my mind on you all. Because in saying this, Paul leaves no one out. No one is left out of the conversation. And no one is left behind. So this is Paul's disciplined approach to consider every face in the room. Every smile that looks back at him. Every tear that is shed and every single member of the Philippian church. We see the same language in Paul's letter to the Colossians. When he instructs them to set their minds on things that are above. It's the very same word. In other words, to feel this way is to set your mind on someone. Why? Because you care about them deeply. Listen to what Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. That's all of the saints. Not just a select few. Not just the special ones. All of them, all of them are special. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we, all of us, may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we, all of us, are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working together, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. From his prison cell, Paul no doubt thinks of Lydia and her family the Philippian jailer and his family, and all who make up the Philippian church. And he cherished the thought of every single one of them. Now the depth of Paul's affection for these people rests in the fact that he holds them in his heart. But what does that mean? What does it mean to hold someone in your heart? Well, one thing is for certain. It's not a casual consideration. It's not simply tipping a hat in recognition, nor is it a quaint hello. What Paul means here is he had these people at the very center of his being, at the deepest part of himself, where his will his decision-making process, and his emotions are fully engaged in this relationship. In other words, Paul loved these people about as much as any 
person could. Listen to what he writes to the Corinthians when it talks about room in your hearts. He says this in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. Make room in your hearts for us. Make some room for us. Think about us. Participate with us in the ministry. Join in. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts. We think about you all the time. You're on our minds. We feel this way about you. To die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I am overjoying, overflowing with joy, excuse me. So the question is, do we make room in our hearts for one another? Is there any space for another person in your life? Do we overflow with joy at the thought of building deep, meaningful relationships with other believers, especially among those who fellowship with us? I can't tell you how important this is, but I can tell you that that's what we've been called to. You see, the Bible speaks of no lone wolf Christians. Rather, we're to love one another. And it's that love which is our testimony of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus said this in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. How? Just as I have loved you, you also are to or must love one another. It's a commandment, not a suggestion. By this, by this what? By this love, all people will know that you are my disciples. Your love will be your testimony. Do we want a credible testimony of what Jesus has done in our life? Then we must love as we've been commanded to love. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, Paul continues in verse 7 in Philippians 1, For you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Now, this might be a new concept for some of us because the word grace here is not just the grace by which we are saved. Rather, Paul considers suffering, sacrifice, and struggling for the gospel to be grace as well. You see, the word grace here means to find favor with God. And in this letter to the Philippians, the closest friends that Paul has have been granted the favor or the grace of suffering with him. We read that in verse 29 of Philippians 1, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also, here it is, suffer for his sake. I mean, doesn't that sound glorious? Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. What's Paul referring to here? Well, I think he's referring to the first time he arrived in Philippi. When these people saw him, they saw him beaten. They saw him being thrown into prison. 
they saw him being escorted to the city limits with an order to never return. And now he sits in Rome, locked up, awaiting his fate. Paul's point is this. They and anyone choosing to follow Jesus, including us today, is not immune to that same treatment. Jesus said, if they hate you because of me, know for certain that they hated me long before they ever hated you. Acts 5, 17. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple. Don't hide. I want you to stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Tell your story about Jesus. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent uh, to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. What's going on here? Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. In verse 25, it's kind of comical, actually. And someone came and told them, look. Look, the men whom you put in prison while well, they're standing in the temple and teaching the people. You think they're afraid of you? I don't think so. They haven't run away. It's broad daylight and they're continuing to preach this Jesus. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Acts 5.40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them, charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council. Here it is. Look at this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, which may be where we're going, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. And so the Philippian church fellowshiped with Paul in his chains by virtue of their prayers and financial gifts. They remembered him as he sat in Rome as a prisoner and they remembered him as though they were in prison with him. Though so far away, Paul could sense that their hearts were entwined with his heart, with the message of the gospel at the core. And it's the richness of this fellowship And it's in the richness of this fellowship from the grace of Paul's suffering for the gospel that became the foundation for this deep mutual affection. You see, it's the gospel that holds us together. It's the good news that in Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself that brings about a God-centeredness that we share with other believers. Well, Paul continues in verse eight, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all, there it is again, 
with the affection of Christ Jesus. From Paul, uh, from Rome, excuse me, Paul was so welled up with emotion that he called God as witness to the depth of his affection for his beloved Philippian friends. Here he is determined to drive home the point of how he felt about them, how he thought about them, and how he set his mind on them. And he wanted to know them most of all. And what he wanted to see, excuse me, he wanted them to see most of all was that his affection for them was in fact the affection of Christ Jesus. Well, how did Jesus love his church? He gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present her to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You see, Jesus' affection for the church cost him everything while he was alive. Cost him his life. He bought her with his own blood. Of this affection, one man writes this. It expresses a yearning that is as much physical as mental. A longing love which moves the whole inner being. But what a remarkable expression Paul uses. He loves them in the inner being of Jesus. Certainly this means that he patterns his love for them on that of Christ. But the wording demands something more than a notion of imitation. Paul is saying that he has advanced in union with Christ that is as if Christ was expressing his love through Paul. Two hearts beating as one, indeed one heart, the greater heart. The greater heart has taken over and the emotional constitution of Christ himself has taken possession of his servant. Paul's affection for his friends in Philippi overflowed because he held them in his heart. Because they shared in the hardship of, his, uh, of ministry with him. And that he longed for them with the affection of Jesus. So here's our challenge this morning. When we look at one another, what do we see? Those of you at home... When you think of somebody, what do you see? Do you see a friend? Do you see a neighbor? Do you see a beloved child of God? You see, we're, to call, we're called to love as Christ loved us. Nothing less. Now, this is extraordinary. I know that. It may seem daunting. Yet it's who we're called to be, and it's what we're called to do. As a pastor, my concern, one of my greatest concerns among believers, is that everyone has a friend, is that everyone has someone to talk to, is that everyone has someone to laugh with and cry on. Now, I can't do this on my own. We all know that. We must all do our part where our minds, attitudes, and dispositions, well, they're set on one another. Why? Because we hold each other in our heart. We care. We care because we've been cared for. So have you thought of any practical ways to bless anyone? Any strategies come to mind? Well, here are a couple of ideas. Maybe you could invite someone you don't know over for a meal. P 
piece of cake or a cup of coffee and just listen to their story. Get to know them. Show interest in their lives. You never know. You just might come to love them. Mentor someone. Invest in someone. And value every believer with the value placed on them by Jesus Christ himself. And then watch the church grow. Let's pray. So Lord, I thank you for this letter to the Philippians. I pray it's an encouragement to all of us. Lord, in this time of trouble in our world, where people are being isolated and I am sure lonely and when despair sets in, I pray someone would come alongside. Invite them over if they can. Call at the very least. I pray that the church would look after one another, would fend for one another, would stand with one another, would link arms with one another, Pick each other up as one falls. Help us to become, Lord, the church that you've called us to be. And Lord, we know especially that you stand with us when no one else will. Paul said that. Everyone had abandoned him, yet you were there, and we're so thankful for that. But I pray that the church would rise up. I pray that the church would stand up. I pray the church would be the church, the body of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we can be effective ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our time, in our communities, in our context, and in our world. So Lord, we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm praying for you all, especially those of you in Manitoba who are locked down. I, um, I just pray that you would reach out to one another as best you can, even if you have to meet on the street and, and visit with somebody. Pray for each other. Encourage one another as best you can. Blessings on you all, and we'll see you next week.